than usual. I'll be doing most of the talking, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. It's chapter 10, uh, where we're talking about managing costs and revenues, which is basically financial management. So you might say, what is financial management? Well, it's basically managing the financials. So you're providing oversight to the organization um, in terms of their financial operations. So that may be in short term, so that may be day-to-day -day operations, or that may be in a long-term period, meaning um, long-term projects that may be for five years or 10 years. So financial management covers both of those um, aspects. And obviously, our goal is to increase the revenues of the organization, um, which is number one. So here are some major objectives of financial management. We want to generate a reasonable net income, which is basically revenues minus expenses. So what you collect minus what you spend is your net income. We want to set prices for our services. We want to create good relationships with third party payers, which are our insurers, because we want those good um, contracts so that we can get paid at a reasonable amount. And we want to make sure that we're watching our own expenses, so our own costs, to make sure that we're not being wasteful and we're not spending more money in things that we should, as well as investing in long-term capital assets, which might be land or buildings or some equipment might be considered long-term capital assets as well if it's something that's really um, expensive, like a diagnostic imaging machine. Um, in some cases, it might be a long-term capital asset. So here are a few more. Um, obviously, we gotta make sure that our employees are paid as well as the people who supply us with things are paid as well. So we gotta make sure our bills are paid. Um, if we're in a certain tax status, if you know, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but uh, for some organizations, protecting that tax status might be a little bit more important than other organizations. And we have to respond to the government whenever they make changes, as we see that a big change just occurred, we have to be able to respond to that and still manage to control our costs. So now we're here to the tax status of organizations. It's basically two categories. You either have a for-profit organization, which is going to be investor-owned, or you'll have a not-for-profit organization in which uh, this type of organization is more geared towards covering the public, covering the community. So the not-for-profits are tax exempt. For-profits, they're going to get taxed. Um, so for the for-profit organizations, because they're investor-owned, their goals are to serve their private interests. So the people that have private interests in that organization, their goal is to service them or to make sure that they're making them money. So. Uh, that basically says that they're trying to maximize the profits for that owner. But they should also be trying to serve the community. I have personally worked for a community hospital that was for profit. So our goal was to make money and provide the investors with that money, but we also, in our mission, talked about serving the community. Um, under the not-for-profit, again, one of the big goals is community benefit. We have to make sure we're taking care of the people that are uninsured or underinsured. And within not-for-profit, there's two different types. You have a private and a government-owned. Um, it's important to note that even the organizations that are not-for-profit still have to make a profit because they have to stay open. So I think one misconception is that people think that, or some people think that not-for-profit organizations, it's okay if they go in the red and they don't have to make a profit. No. They have to make a profit because they have to stay open. They have to pay salaries. They have to pay bills. So they still have to make a profit, too. Um, here are just a couple of characteristics of for-profit organizations. Like I said, they serve private interests. They pay taxes. Um, they may or may not participate in political or politics, political campaigns. They're obviously motivated by profit. And <clears throat> Their obligation to serve the community and the indigent and uh, uninsured is a little bit less than a not-for-profit. Um, here are the not-for-profit characteristics. They are exempt from taxes. Um, they primarily serve the community. They cannot participate in politics or political campaigns. And they have to, it's required, they have to provide to the community, which is why they are very exempt from taxes. So as, as a um, kind of a trade-off for being exempt from taxes, they have to provide community benefit. Uh, so again, 
some of you guys may be new to financial management and you may not really understand how it fits into healthcare. And this kind of tells you, gives you an idea about how it goes. So obviously the board of directors or the governing board is going to be at the top. The next uh, level down is the CEO or the president of the hospital. And now the next level under the CEO is called a CFO, which is the chief financial officer, which is basically the top report for anybody working within any type of financial area or department within the organization. So the CFO is kind of the, the big cheese with, when it comes to financials. They're the ones that are doing the final checkoffs on any proposals or anything related to financials. And up under the CFO, you'll have a controller, you may have a treasurer, uh, if you have any internal auditors, all these people report to the CFO. And then under them, you have any managers. So any accounting managers, financial managers that may work in the organization also will report up to the CFO. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about reimbursements from third party payers. Um, there's two main types. Um, there's a retrospective method, which is um, determined after the service is provided. Um, and these primarily make up charges and charges minus a discount or cost plus. And then you have perspective, which is before the service delivery. So you might think of this as a, a co-pay as an example of a um, perspective payment or a per diem or a per diagnosis or capitation. Um, these are a few methods that are used by um, Medicare and Medicaid. The reimbursements to the hospitals work a little different from reimbursements to physicians. Within the hospitals, they work uh, primarily with DRGs, which are um, called diagnosis-related groups. They also work with the case mix or the patient mix, whereas the physicians um, are billed or, or reimbursed based on RBRBSs, which is, stands for Resource-Based Relative Value Scale. So basically, um, physicians are paid more so on the units of service they're providing, whereas the hospitals are um, paid more on the actual um, service that's provided, which is dependent on how the patient is diagnosed. Um, does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Let me pause there and make sure that was kind of clear. Um, now those that don't have any insurance at all are going to be billed for the full charges. Um, and as we know, this has caused people to go bankrupt. Some people have liens on their houses because of hospital and medical bills. So it can be pretty serious. Um, and there's two different types of basically what is called uncompensated care. The first type is bad debt. So the bad debt is um, costs that we as a hospital have sent out to the patients and they just haven't paid. At some point we have to write it off. We can't continue to collect or try to collect this money forever because it's a bad use of our resources. Because every time we try to collect this money, we're using staff, we're using, if we're outsourcing it, we're paying an outsourcer to chase these people now. So after a certain point, you just gotta write it off. Once it's written off, that's the bad debt. And then the other category is the charity care, which is when the hospital brings the patient in or takes the patient in, knowing that they don't have the ability to pay, and it's just like it's called, it's charity care. So the hospital kind of provides that care, knowing they're not gonna give it back, just kind of, I don't, I don't want to say free, but um, it's basically charity. Tax write-offs. Right. So what? They're already tax exempt, so well, the not-for-profit ones. You will find that there are some um, for-profit hospitals that will also do charity care, too. And in that sense, then they probably can put it towards their, their taxes. Um, so regardless of um, if you end up being a manager within a specific accounting department or financial department, even if you're the manager of you know, cardiology or whatever it may be, you still will be responsible for trying to control your costs. And here are a few ways that, that um, managers control the costs. Well, it is very helpful to make sure that you're, you estimate your costs, um, if not exactly, pretty close to it. So if you're working in a department and you know every year you have to order X, Y, Z, 
One way of controlling costs is to make sure that the estimates that you provide are pretty accurate. You don't want to say we need you know, 50 of these and you're only going to use 10 because then you're not controlling your costs. You're paying way too much. Um, you also want to make sure that you're analyzing the profits um, as well as um, when you set the charges. You also have to be reasonable when you do that. Otherwise, it may kind of affect you on the back end when, when it comes to the cost. Um, there may be some services that you're not providing that you think you want to provide, or there may be some services that you are providing and you're not making money on them. In e either situation, these are decisions as a manager that you would make to try to um, you know, determine, is this service worth us doing or do we need to cut the service so that we can better control our costs? Um, and then the last way that they control costs is to make sure that um, we're allocating and, and classifying things correctly. If we have something in one category and it should be in another one, it may cause us to, to uh, lose money or, or um, be paying more than we should be for that. So how do we classify those costs? There's a few different ways. We can classify by behavior, by traceability, or just by kind of making good decisions. So if we classify by behavior, we can look at the fixed cost or the variable cost. If we classify by traceability, we're going to look at the direct cost, the indirect cost, and the full cost. And if we classify by our decision-making skills, we're going to look at controlling co controllable costs or uncontrollable costs. Um, cost allocation is something that's pretty important because it deals with figuring out what the total cost would be of providing a patient or a customer with service um, that includes everything, not just the actual things that, if a patient comes in and needs knee surgery, when we're cost allocating, we're not just looking at the cost of the actual sur surgery, we have to look at the cost of all the nurses, the CNAs, and everybody that may be involved in that patient while they're in the hospital. We have to look at the actual room that the, sur the surgeon's going to be in, um, the supplies that are being used. So cost allocation um, challenges you to consider everything that's involved in that interaction with that patient, whether it's direct or indirect costs, whether it's revenue producing or not revenue producing, we still have to consider everything. And the reason that we do cost as allocation is because we have to make sure that we're fair and that the patients are only being charged for the things that they received and not anything else. Um, so how do we determine product cost? Because everything we do has to have a cost. Everything has to have a cost connected to it. So there's a few different ways um, to determine product cost, but one is activity-based costing. Um, basically, with this method, um, the costs are dependent on or determined by what is called cost drivers which are the activities that are basically involved in generating a unit of service. So I'll pause right there to make sure everybody understands that. Make sense to everybody? Um, and when it comes to setting charges, um, this can be a little bit confusing because some people will say they went on a website and they saw a charge uh, for X, Y, Z. And so they automatically assume that that's what they're going to have to pay. And that's not always true, which is why more often than not, you won't find a lot of charges posted on hospital websites just because everybody has different insurance and everybody has different contracts. So charges are basically published prices. Um, but as it says here, um, because every insurance company is going to have a contract with a hospital or organization, and they're going to negotiate that contract and say how much they're going to pay for each service. So my contract with Blue Cross can be totally different from my contract with Aetna or United or, or whoever else. So because of that, um, the charges that you see online aren't completely accurate. It should rather be used kind of just as a ballpark. Now prices, on the other hand, deal with the actual money that was spent. So the, the take home here is to note that prices are different from charges. It's not the same thing. Um, Charges is kind of a, a global, overall global fee, um, whereas prices is the actual money that was actually spent. 
Um, so how do we set our charges and prices? Well, we obviously have to make sure it's something fair and legal. It can't be some ridiculous price or cost or charge. Like Fifty dollars for an aspirin. Yeah. Um, we have to make sure that we have, as an organization, we have to have our own pricing goals. Again, we have to make money. So while we don't want to be unfair or illegal, we still have to price, um, have goals, pricing goals that make sure that we're at least attempting to make a profit. Um, we have to look at the market conditions. So our pricing goals might change um, if you know the area that we're in has a high percentage of job loss, a lot of people have been losing their jobs, or know that a lot of people are uninsured. Our pricing goals may change a little bit. Or if we find that the demand for our services has gone down, if no one wants to come to our organization anymore, they're going down the street, again, our pricing goals might change. Um, we also have to consider, again, our third party payers. So if we find that this contract that we have with Blue Cross is just not working for us anymore, it may mean that we need to reset our pricing goals. We may need to go back to them and try to renegotiate our contract. We also have to think about the other people in the market, our competitors, where they price that. Um, and just some of it is just tactics and strategy as to how we figure out how we're going to price things. Um, some of it you have to be a little you may have to be a little creative at times when you come to the pricing. Um, but it really is something that you have to take all of these things into consideration, not just one or, or two of these. It's kind of something that you have to look, think about each of these things when you're trying to set your prices and charges. Um, <clears throat> working capital, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, the formal definition is total <coughs> current assets. Everybody knows what assets are? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody give me an example of an asset. Money. Money. All right, cash, that's what? Stocks, bonds. Stocks and bonds, okay. Land. Land, another one. So you guys, so yeah, all of those are assets. Um, working capital or any assets that can be converted to cash within one year. So if, if it can't be converted to cash within one year, it's not working capital. It might still be capital, but it's not considered working capital. Um, plus the current liabilities. Everybody know what liabilities are? <laughs> it's kind of the opposite. It's kind of the opposite of, of an asset. Um, Long story. So, um, the primary sources of working capital, um, permanent work, working capital, um, net income or your profits uh, is another primary source of working capital. And then we have temp temporary working capital, which includes might include equity or sh short term debt or loans or, or credit. So these are all primary sources of working capital. So you might say, all right, I know what it is now, but what's the purpose of it or what, what is it? So the purpose of working capital is to obviously, again, we're, well, we're always trying to make money. So the purpose, one purpose is to increase our revenues, the money that we're bringing in, and also reduce our expenses, so the money that's going out by making our capital assets productive or making money. So um, if we take the example of land that you used, our goal is going to be able to make that land make us money. So that may require putting something on that land, a building that we can run out to doctors or you know, a satellite location for XYZ, whatever it may be. All of our capital assets that we have, we want to try to make them make us money. Now that's the, one of the main purposes of working capital. Um, another one is to conserve our cash, so save our money by cutting our financing costs. So if we have um, you know, these ridiculous um, rates or finance costs, we want to try to cut those down because obviously, as with your credit cards, the higher your finance percentage is for that card, the more money you're shelling out, right? So it's kind of the same concept. We're trying to cut our financing costs and conserve our cash. And working capital helps us to do that. It also helps us to manage our cash flow. Everybody should know what cash flow is. Flow of cash, basically. So we want to be able to manage our inflow, so the money that we're getting in, and our outflows, the money that's going out. And then the last um, purpose of working capital is to manage the liquidity of the organization. Anybody know what liquidity is? 
Yeah, but I'll take yes. <laughs> Are we talking about like the equity in your house type deals? Like, um, not yeah, equity, what you, oh, liquidity. Like you, I'll pass you oh, liquidity. Oh, it's like something you can like, well, sell for cash. cash. It's like cash value. Yes. Say it again. How fast you can convert it to cash? Right. And so working capital helps us to, to make sure that we're managing that within our organization. A um, few other things. We want to enhance goodwill. Everybody know what goodwill is? Goodwill is basically like your reputation, your brand. So you always want to have positive goodwill. Um, and the way that you create positive goodwill, number one, you pay your bills on time. If you're working with a vendor that supplies you with um, drugs, prescription drugs, and you're not paying your bills on time, word travels. Then no one else is going to want to work with you. So that means your goodwill is going back down, negative goodwill. And um, the other way you enhance your goodwill is by demonstrating to lenders or people that's lending you money that your organization is credit worthy. So when you get to the point where you want to do these huge capital projects, where you're building a new hospital, or you're doing a large renovation, you won't have all that money to shell out, so you'll need to get loans. So before you get to that point, you have to be able to prove to the lenders that they can be able to loan you money and you're going to be able to pay it back. Um, so uh, managing accounts receivable. Accounts receivable is, anybody know? The asset. Or a revenue that's coming in. Okay. Or is it revenue that's coming in? Or is it revenue that we're expecting to come in? Or expecting to come in. There we go. I'll say it. So that's accounts receivable. Um, it typically doesn't provide any interest. And the longer that you have things in accounts receivable, the less likely that you're going to actually collect it. Bless you. Um, so <clears throat> having a large amount of money in your accounts receivable is not a good thing. It's bad. Because it means that we as an organization are not collecting the money fast enough. And if we don't have that money, if we're not collecting it, we're not making money. We can't um, make a profit or we can't use that money to put into other projects that we may have within the organization. So the take home here is large AR, not good. Small AR is good. Um, again, like I just said, for some projects, we may need to receive cash in advance. Um, on some of our AR balances. And there's two ways that we do this. We might sell at a discount, or we may pledge the receivables as a collateral to try to negotiate. So in most cases, um, this is something that can be easily done. But again, it kind of goes back to the goodwill of that organization. If our goodwill of our organization is not good, no one's one are gonna, you know, use anything for collateral to negotiate with us. So the goodwill part is very important, not just for the working capital, but for other things as well, like the AR. Um, so I think sometimes when we think about cost, we sometimes forget about inventory, which is pretty important, especially certain parts of inventory, like drugs. They're very expensive. So we have to manage our materials and inventory just as good as we manage our actual dollars. Um, and so most hospitals will have a materials management department that focuses only on this, managing inventory, making sure that of each type of supply we have adequate levels of it, that we're not being wasteful, that we're getting the best cost for those supplies, again, to try to make sure we're minimizing our costs, um, and that we're not just having a lot of inventory that's just sitting there and, and is not being sold. So here's a few um, different types um, uh, or methods for stocking inventory. We have the JIT, which is just in time. It's basically self-explanatory. The, the products are delivered just in time for you to sell them or provide them to, to our customers. And what that does is it obviously decreases the cost because we're basically kind of only ordering what we need and we run less of a risk of the products we have that aren't um, good anymore. And then we have the ABC inventory method. And with this method, basically each item is assigned to one of three groups. And so at this point, it can be monitored basically at no cost. Um, so here's some key important 
um, things to remember about materials management is really based a lot on developing good relationships with your vendors. Again, the better relationship you have with the vendor, the more likelihood um, you'll have to get those discounts that you need for the products and, or, and just the customer service when things go wrong. If you have a good relationship with your vendor, it, it can be very beneficial. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Mm -hmm. The method for stocking the inventory, like the ABC and the JR, mm -hmm. is it the same thing as the inventory techniques? As a universal technique? As the inventory techniques. Oh, as the LIFO and the FIFO? Mm -hmm. is it it's, the it's a little different. It's a good question. Um, we'll talk a little bit that, more about that in a little bit. They, they are two different things, though. They're kind of related, but two, two separate things. Um, the other um, important thing to remember with materials management is that it's important to understand the true cost of your inventory. You need to understand how much everything costs. And I'll give you a quick example of this. I was on a project one time in the hospital, the surgery de um, department um, project, and we were looking at the um, tools and the surgical utensils that are used for surgeries. And we were trying to convince the surgeons that we needed to switch to a different vendor because the costs were a lot less. And you know the surgeons were like, oh, this, this scalp only costs 35 cents. You're, you're absolutely correct. But when you multiply that 35% times thousands and thousands, it's a lot of money, right? So it's important to understand the true cost of everything and not necessarily just look at each individual piece uh, or each individual item as you know, being 50 cents or 10 cents, when you multiply that times the huge volumes of patients that you're get, gonna get every year, you could potentially be save, saving or losing a lot of money. Um, so it's very important to, to understand um, how the inventory can really affect your costs. Um, <clears throat> another thing that usually helps is creating a, a service an in-service or a training program for not just the management team, in my opinion, but kind of everybody, maybe in your department, so that they also understand how negotiations with vendors work, how supplies work, and why um, we may need to switch to using a different type of toilet paper because it's gonna save us a lot of money. Um, I find that these training programs can be pretty helpful. Um, the other thing is um, with materials management, from time to time you may have to do some calculations. And one example of that is being able to calculate the economic order quantity um, to basically know how many or of each item or what quantity of certain supplies should be ordered at the right time. So again, if I go back to my example before, if we're ordering 50 of something and really only need to be ordering 10, we could be losing a lot of money. So that's where this uh, calculation can come into play and be really helpful. Um, so managing budgets, obviously there's a few different ways or a few different types of budgets that we'll have. You're gonna have an operating budget, which is pretty self-explanatory. This is the budget that you'll use for your operations. Um, you'll have an expense budget, a revenue budget, and a capital budget. And like we talked about earlier, the capital budget is more so used for larger scale projects, those that are gonna be more long-term like, uh, again, renovations or, or building something completely new. Um, obviously, this, um, typically these capital budgets are much more uh, high dollar than your operational budgets. Um, so when we're creating our capital budget, there's a few questions that we need to ask and be able to answer. Number one, does this asset at least pay for itself? If we acquire a new mammography machine, is this mammography machine gonna pay for itself? Are we gonna be able to bring in enough patients and, and do uh, mammograms on them for us to be able to pay for, for itself? And does this asset add value to the organization? If we purchase this uh, mammogram machine or mammography machine, is it going to cut down on the, the incidence of breast cancer? How is this gonna affect our patients and our community? Is this something that will you know, add value to our organization and we'll be able to say that we're uh, the leading healthcare organization in Fayetteville for detecting breast cancer. So these two questions are really important uh, when it comes to capital budgeting. 
And again, these are the types of things that are included in capital budgets. It talks about land, facility construction, um, capital equipment. This could also include upgrades. So if you already have something, but it's kind of outdated and you want a new one, um, depending on, on the scale of the um, equipment, it could also be a capital um, budgeting and acquisition of staff positions. If we're acquiring a large group of physicians from a big practice, it could also be um, under a capital budgeting if, you know, when we do the calculations, the compensation of all these positions is going to be in the millions. Um, so in most cases, each department will somewhat have a wish list of things they like. You know, the surgery department's going to want all these new fancy things. Um, <clears throat> cardiology department's going to want things. And basically everybody submits their wish list to the finance department. And again, as we talked about earlier, it kind of moves up the ranks. So the managers will take a look at it first and it will ultimately end up in the hands of the chief financial officer. And after it's gone through the chief financial officer, if they check off on it, the last people who see it is that governing board. So the board of governors um, will be the last person to either say yes or no. And again, it's the governing body's job to, to keep in mind the organization's mission to make sure that we're staying in line with the mission with this purchase. Um, now to go back to your question about uh, LIFO and FIFO. It's a little bit different. It sounds like you know you understand what it is, right? LIFO is last and first out, FIFO is first and first out. So do we think that both are used in healthcare? Mm -hmm. Yes. Someone said no. Yes. Someone said yes. Yeah. Yes, they're yes. both used in healthcare. Where might FIFO be used? Um like um let's say lab. Yes. In the exactly. Lab. A lab, a pharmacy. Um, are good examples. We want to. We have to make because those products can expire, right? right. So we have to make sure that they're Use moving. The right. Then, then now, right. where might LIFO be used in a healthcare organization? Um, this one's bandages. a little bit difficult. Sorry. It would be like bandages and stuff like that. Stuff uh, saline stuff that takes longer to expire, but does expire, but. Still or or it could be the worst part equipment. Of yes, Hospital exactly. Equipment. That's more. This is a more notable example. Is equipment. So durable medical equipment, crutches, wheelchairs, things that have no expiration date, where it doesn't matter. So it could be lasting. A cane is going to be a cane, regardless of if it's been there for a month or one day. So in that example, so so hospitals do use both methods, but depending on the actual department, is going to determine which method they're going to use. Now it wouldn't be smart for a lab or a um, uh, pharmacy to use LIFO obviously because then we we're you know held liable if we're getting somebody something expired right so um, the take home there is just kind of knowing depending on which department it is which method is going to work best for you or or if it matters for some departments it may not matter like I said a band aid is a band aid so you give them the first one that came in or the last one that came in they still going to get the job done so so good question any other questions about what we talked about today. Uh, we've come to the last slide, so if there's no other questions, then we're done for the day. Have a great weekend.